Thank you. The, the next uh, speaker is, uh, is John Martin, who um, joined me, but plus, I should give you a little bit of background. I, at the time, early on, I thought you always want more than one canoe in case one canoe, from their experience, one canoe gets in trouble or lost or something, you have backups. Um, on our trip in 74, we did have one of these air, small airplane ELPs, emergency locator transmitter. If something bad had happened, we could have turned that on and let people know that there was an issue and so on. But, uh, but John was my physics, uh, one of my physics uh, yes. colleagues yeah. at the University yeah, yeah. of Toronto. Yeah. And you might be interested. We thought, well, we have to meet somebody else. Yeah. Couldn't find anybody. Then John Bland, who's here, who has a relative with a young kid, just so that they thought he ought to come with us, and he did come. And then I needed a fourth person. And the way that happened, this is kind of funny. I was teaching first year physics with about a thousand students taking it. They would take final exams in this large auditorium. And one student in that class had come to my office a few times to talk about canoeing, look at the pictures I had on the wall, and so on. So as I was walking through the exam, I saw him there, I said, might you be interested in a canoe in July? <laughs> and he said, yes. <laughs> and sure enough, he came by, and so there was John and I, not that old, and two much younger people on it, and so on. Anyways, John, it's, uh, look forward to hearing you. You're on. Uh, thank you, George. I must say, I'm a bit intimidated being here. It's my first time at a canoe symposium like the last speaker. And also, I've only done one long trip in the north uh, with George. And most of you know a lot more about the north and canoeing than I do. But nevertheless, here we go. In early 1973, George uh, came into my office and persuaded me that we should try this crazy trip following uh, the route of J.B. Turrell in 1894. We just heard about uh, his trip down the Dubont in 1893, but in that 1893 trip, he'd heard about uh, this uh, parallel river, which later was called the Kazan, so he was uh, trying to find that route to the north as well. So we decided to follow that, and uh, as George said, we had uh, four guys. The youngest was this Mike Good. He, he was about 18, just out of high school, and, and uh, quite naive and inexperienced. In fact, George was so worried about us that he took us on a, uh, a trip in May on the Petawawa River just to make sure we could all paddle. <laughs> anyway, this is, uh, oops, sorry. So this is uh, Turrell. He was one of these larger-than-life Canadians, worked for the Geological Survey of Canada. And this is his true, uh, crew on the 1894 trip. In fact, the trip almost never happened because it, uh, they didn't have enough money, but... Uh, but, but this guy was an independently wealthy uh, person, Ferguson, who was aide-de-camp of the Governor General. And he decided he'd uh, help finance the trip if he was allowed to go along. So he was the partner, and then there were all these guys that did the real work. So anyway, our trip was from uh, Reindeer Lake and then up the Cochrane Little Partridge into Caswell Lake and then down the Kazan through the great big lakes, Anadai, Angakuni, Yathked, and on into uh, Baker Lake. So this uh, gives a, an idea of the two trips. Uh, of course, back in 1894, you couldn't get as far north, so they started paddling on uh, June 23rd down here at Grand Rapids, went up over the famous Frog Portage into the Saskatchewan, and up the Reindeer River uh, into Reindeer Lake, where we joined them on June 27th. Uh, in, in 1974, and then we went north on this route all the way to Baker Lake. Uh, we were about a month earlier, of course, so the weather was better. Uh, Turrell bailed out in September, uh, found this other route uh, down to a river which he called the Ferguson after his friend, and eventually made it down to Hudson's Bay, uh, sorry, to Churchill on October 1st, waited for the freeze up, and then went by dog sled down to Norway house and got there in time for Christmas dinner. So that was a rather long trip compared to ours. Ours was just a, a mere seven weeks on the water. So we had uh, George's 17 and 18 foot Grumman's. I'm grateful we had those uh, strong aluminum canoes. We had maps, some aerial photographs of uh, this region, and Turrell's notes. 
1894, they had uh, these two guys had several canoemen and a cook. They had two Peterborough canoes and one birch bark canoe, which uh, came up with them as far as Brochet, then turned back. Uh, there, Terrell hired two Chippewa guides to get them up this far, and, and then he got uh, a couple of Inuit guides to take them further on. So here we are out on Reindeer Lake the first three days. It's a beautiful big lake. And uh, coming into Brochet at the end of day three. So George is one of these really well-prepared guys, fortunately, because the rest of us weren't. Uh, the supplies he ordered from the Hudson Bay store in Lynn Lake, we'd driven to the Paw, taken the train to Lynn Lake. So we picked up our supplies there and had uh, half of our food flown into Anadai Station on Anadai Lake. Anyway, this is George's list for the Hudson Bay uh, post. You can see there was a lot of dried fruit, not too many prunes. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, I was not in George's tent, so I don't, I don't know whether. <laughs> uh, see, we had uh, 18 pounds of canned butter and so on. Anyway, these, this is the community at Brochet at that time. Uh, these are some Chippewa and kids. These are basically the last people we saw until Enadai Station. So here we are the first day on the Cochrane. We're going uphill, so dragging a lot. I don't, the other canoes on the other side over there. This is the first portage, which uh, was a total surprise to us, but I guess the uh, Chippewans use them for dragging their motorboats over at those times. Anyway. Didn't make uh, carrying the canoe up so easy. There are a lot of fine campsites on the Cochran. You could just pick and choose wherever you wanted to go. We came across several of these uh, bird hatching islands. This was the first one on the Cochran where you, you can see, I think these are terns. And here you can see uh, a chick just hatching in its nest. We took a, a shortcut that uh, Turrell had followed around some bad part of the Cochrane through the little, little creeks and little lakes and so on. And here we were uh, stuck on a sandbar out right in the middle of a lake. I got, uh, I know, uh, preparing this talk, I went to, to the library at Toronto. I discovered they've digitized all this stuff of Turrells. It's uh, really worth a visit if, if you want to bone up on your Turrell history. Anyway, they allowed me to uh, uh, take some of their photographs and show them here today. So here's Turrell's crew going up the Cochrane, and uh, apparently he was windbound on the Cochrane one day. It's hard work going uphill, as many of you know. A lot of pulling up, heavy paddling up, but then there's these big lakes you come to. This is Lac Brochet, I think, over here. We had a beautiful, calm day there. Here's another one of George's preparation slides. So we really depended on fish. We were assuming four days a week for our fish meal, supplemented with some freeze-dried uh, food as well. Anyway, fortunately, we had George along. He was a good fisherman. The rest of us weren't. This was the only uh, serious fish that Mike caught. Uh, but George was catching these, these kind of fish most of the trip, fortunately. So we camped down here by uh, Chippewa Falls, but whenever we saw a hill nearby, we, uh, we decided to climb it to get the view. So this is a beautiful view of, of the uh, Cochrane at Chippewa Falls. And here we are leaving the Cochrane. So this is our, our crew, the four of us there, Mike the youngest, John Blackborough, he was uh, probably the strongest guy next to George. Fortunately, he was in the bow of my canoe. So that was good. I see we had similar packs to the ones uh, Fred showed on his 1955 trip. Uh, nothing like these beautiful things you have nowadays. And we had these beautiful fiberglass paddles, but also some lighter uh, wooden paddles. So just to show you this part of the trip in a little more detail. So the, uh, the Cochrane River flows out of Wollaston Lake going north, and normally we'd head over to Hudson's Bay, but there's sort of a 
freakish bit of geology here. The land rose up a bit and forced the uh, Cochrane River to flow back south into Reindeer Lake. So you have to make a little bit of overland here, and then and you go downhill to Casimir Lake through a series of lakes, and then up the Little Partridge River to Roosevelt Lake, and then across the height of land down to Casbah Lake. This shows the uh, the elevation going along there, about uh, 250 miles or so. So you go up, then down, then back up a couple of hundred feet, and then back down. So after about three weeks, you get back to exactly the same elevation that you started at. Not so much fun. Anyway, from there, 1,100 feet above sea level, it goes downhill to Baker Lake, which is about 60 feet above sea, sea level. So Turrell had uh, 44 portages between the Cochrane exit and uh, Caswell Lake. I think we did maybe 35 or so. Anyway, there's definitely a lot of portaging through there, hard work. This shows the end of that portage from the Cochrane into the series of lakes. I think it's exactly the same place, uh, Turrell coming out and, and us coming out. There's some gorgeous portages between these lakes. We always had a bit of difficulty finding them, but once you got up on top of them, they were easy to follow and beautiful. As I said, John was a strong guy, and he liked to make all his uh, trips in one go, so he took carried about 200 pounds of packs on each, uh, each trip through. Well, I carried the canoe and then went back for another pack. So this, we think, is the grave of old Kazmir, a famous uh, Chippewa chief of the Narrows in uh, Fort Hall Lake, a beautiful place. It's a Narrows in the lake, and the story goes that he uh, sat there and collected tolls from the passers-by in the trading days. I'm not sure if that's true or not. It's fantastic scenery along here on this route down to Kashmir Lake. Uh, and eventually we came uh, across a cabin. And this may be the winter home of the Chippewa Chief Redhead, which uh, Turrell talks about on Thanout Lake, which is just a different name for Fort Hall Lake. But I was just looking in uh, P.G. Downs' book over there on the table before my talk. He went through this area uh, to New Elton Lake in uh, 1939 and mentioned finding the remains of Fort Hall. So this, in fact, may have, may have been the uh, Fort Hall. Anyway, it was beautifully built, but uh, in the ruins at that time. And then there's this boiling falls and rapids down to Casimir Lake. And uh, we decided to portage around that, 2,000 meters. <laughs> so Casimir Lake, we go across, and then we start going up the little partridge. So I was astounded at this. There's all these boulder channels in this, uh, in this river, presumably pushed down by the ice, but they looked almost man-made. Anyway, they were reasonably easy to drag up. And here's showing us dragging up another one of them, and Turrell's crew dragging up a, one of the same ones. The Little Parch is definitely a little river. It disappears every now and again. And you come across, listen, what do you do here? Where's the river? Where's the portage? Well, it was a rainy day. Those rocks were really slippery, and it was a long portage in high wind. <laughs> But we made it across without breaking any legs, fortunately. And here we are, I think, entering the Northwest Territories at the time, now Nunavut. And I think this is a picture of pretty much exactly the same spot uh, back in 1894. Here we are preparing bread. We, we pre-packaged our bread before we left and, and baked it up every couple of days. Just had to add water and black flies, no problem, and, <laughs> and bake it. By now, the, uh, the trees were starting to thin out, and we had these beautiful places to, to stop for lunches. Lunch, we were always quite hungry, so you can see we were intent here. We had lots of food on this trip, but in fact, we didn't have quite enough goodies for lunch. By the end of the trip, we were separating them out in piles of four before we ate them. 
So we'd had some bad weather too. This was a cool and misty rainy night. Uh, you can see our uh, well used teapot and this was the reflector oven for baking the bread. Well, we finally made it up to Little Partridge and uh, camped high above uh, Roosevelt Lake there. In fact, I think we were on Roosevelt Hill. Uh, it turns out Ferguson was a, uh, a climbing companion of Teddy Roosevelt, and that's how this lake got its name. Anyway, every, every week or so we stopped for a day and had a, had a day off, wash our clothes and all that sort of thing. So we always tried to pick a beautiful spot. Uh, then we headed on to uh, Casba Lake through a series of seven or eight lakes and nine or ten portages. This was a difficult area to find your way through with our maps. In fact, we went into the wrong lake at one point, paddled around, eventually figured out we were on the wrong one with, the, with our uh, aerial survey photographs. Anyway, eventually we got back to the right route. On some of those portages, we found evidence of... Uh, blazing on trees, so there must have still been trappers using these roots, at least somewhat in those days. And then we went through a burned region. We saw a tremendous fire last night. Anyway, here we didn't see the fire, but we saw saw the result of it and had to portage through that. By the end of that, we were all quite black. You can see Mike crashed into some trees over here. Anyway, eventually we got uh, got through there, and on this night we raced up a hill and got our few, first view of Casba Lake. And I tell you, that was that was a terrific sight after three weeks of pulling up these rivers. So we had a big toast of our uh, remaining Drambuie, and that's a higher up that same hill later that night. George took a beautiful sunset photograph. So now we're out on Casba Lake, this huge lake, which is the source of the uh, Kazan River. And they have these beautiful eskers that uh, come out into the lake. I think uh, this is Turrell's picture of the same esker. But I couldn't believe how beautifully these uh, things are naturally landscaped. Another one of these bird islands with the uh, parents upset and screaming overhead. And you hear this one using the great outdoor toilet. So this was our first rapid going down the down the Kazan, so that was a big thrill. And then we came across a lot of uh, Canada geese nesting. And in fact, there's a proverbial gaggle of geese there, which we could easily pick up, and they liked being uh, tickled under their throats, it turned out. <laughs> So then we made it down to Enadai Lake, the next huge lake. Uh, in fact, uh, we heard about sailing from a couple of these trips. We actually sailed across Enadai Lake, too. Not quite as professionally as we saw uh, this morning. But nevertheless, we made it through, except for this passing uh, thunderstorm at uh, noon, where we had to climb up a hill and try not to get struck by lightning. I guess we shouldn't have climbed the hill, but anyway. <laughs> but uh, I was amazed to see these uh, storms passing through so fast, as we heard about from some other people today. Uh, these times you wish you had a movie camera when you see these things flying through. Anyway, later that night it would calm down. And... So we got to the end of Anadai Lake, and... Uh, Fortunately, our shipment of food was here at this weather station, which was still manned at that time by uh, two radio men, uh, a cook and a mechanic. But the cook and the mechanic were away. Most unfortunate that the cook was away. But anyway, the, the two radio men cooked us up some pork chops, which we were grateful for. And we repacked our food there and carried on. Now, at this point, uh, Turrell lost his Chippewan guides because they were afraid to go on and meet the, uh, uh, the Caribou Inuit who were just, just north of this area. So Turrell was on his own at this point and heading north and not really sure where he was going to end up. 
Here's lunch on another beautiful esker. This was on the river north of Anadai. And later that evening on the, uh, the river, it had been a gray day, and the wind howling through. You can see our tents pitched in a tandem down here to try and protect each other. In fact, we had to stop. We were sort of wind blowing on, even going down the river. There's our canoe down there. So we took a long hike, but we came back, and uh, suddenly the weather changed from the west, and this beautiful pattern of light and clouds went whipping by at about 40 miles an hour. It was just a beautiful sight. So we started now seeing many remains of the uh, the Caribou Inuit. Uh, here was a grave, and this person had a lot of possessions, obviously. Here's this... Uh, kayak paddle over here, but he had a tin kettle, and so on. I must say the Kazan is just a gorgeous river. I'm sure many of you have been down it, but uh, those of you who haven't, I would uh, highly recommend it. And you see these beautiful thunderstorms passing through all the time. And by now we were carrying wood because we were north of the tree line. And Turrell started meeting uh, the Inuit at this point. And in fact, they were extremely friendly to him and curious. Many of them had never seen a white person before, of course, at that time. It was a thriving culture, probably a thousand people living on this river, up and down it. But of course, they eventually got enmeshed in the, uh, uh, with the white people and got involved in the trapping and the booming white fox trade in the 1920s, and then when that collapsed, uh, there were two or three decades of tremendous hardship and starvation, starvation for these people. And eventually, uh, the remaining ones were moved to the various communities, like Baker Lake around 1957. So it's a rather sad story, but you can see, even in Turrell's time, it was a thriving culture, these fantastic kayaks. I love this picture of uh, this guy portaging, almost in camouflage. And here's Ferguson uh, with a whole bunch of uh, kayak paddlers lined up. I wonder how long it took them to organize that photograph. <laughs> <laughs> and here's one of the camps. This is one of the biggest camps that Tyrrell came to, Hallow's Camp. And here he picked up a uh, father and son guide. Uh, to take them down to Hudson Bay. Well, here we are camped on the next big lake. And somebody mentioned the sunsets up there are tremendous. And the bugs that we've also heard about. This was probably one of our worst nights. <laughs> but uh, this is John Blackborough. That night he uh, made the mistake of leaning over the fire and burnt a hole right in the middle of his net. <laughs> which we uh, frantically repaired with some duct tape that we had along with us. This is one of our typical camps when we took a day off. I don't know if you can read that bag. It says, Honest Eds. <laughs> Those of you from Toronto know what I mean. And there's our reflector oven. It seemed that day we baked a lot of bread, prob probably with blueberries. And this was another day. I see we're making a fish chowder here with some freeze-dried... Uh, Vegetables, and there's, I think, is a cheesecake ready for the blueberries to go, go on top. So we ate quite well, actually, on this trip. <laughs> we saw a lot of bird life, uh, including these peregrine falcons nesting over there on that cliff. In fact, George got right up there and was able to take some uh, portraits. Even the babies, they're obviously born to be ferocious. It's quite amazing. This is another falcon we saw later on at uh, Kazan Falls. Uh, somebody will know what that is. It may be a jeer falcon. There's a beautiful series of drops right after Angakuni Lake over a period of a, a stretch of a mile or so. This is uh, having lunch at the second of those drops, but they're incredibly scenic. And then we camped at the third one and then uh, portaged down and exited from there on down the river. 
So between uh, Angakuni and Yathkel Lake, Turl was starting to get worried. And in fact, at this point, uh, he had, was able to communicate enough that he, he confirmed the, his fear that the Kazan actually flowed all the way to Baker Lake. And since he was a month behind us, it was already getting extremely cold and he didn't want to repeat his experience of the previous year where he almost froze to death going down to uh, Churchill. In fact, they, they turned back at that point. But just, uh, just then he heard from this uh, guy, Pazimut, that there was an alternate route to, to Hudson Bay which would uh, get him there sooner. And he drew a map. I love this map. It's, uh, this is showing Yathkid Lake. It's not quite to, to scale, obviously. And then on down to Ford Lake and into Baker Lake. But this was the route. It was just a hand-drawn and pencil, and then uh, into this lake, uh, which Turrell eventually named the Ferguson Lake when he got there, and then the Ferguson River down to Hudson Bay. But it shows all the essentials, just with a few uh, pencil sketches. Anyway, this, uh, I think, was at about the last camp that uh, uh, they were at, where they bailed out just south of the Lake. Anyway, here's our first view of Yath Kied Lake. I can't pronounce that very well. We climbed another high hill to, to get the view. And another gorgeous sunset. Yath is the is the biggest lake on the Kazan, and we were a bit worried about it. And in fact, we did get caught out in the middle of it. We thought it was calm on a six-mile run over to an island, but uh, the wind picked up enormously. We just barely made it to the island. Otherwise, we would have been blown 40, 40 miles off to the south shore. Anyway, we, we paused for a while. But the, the wind went down that night, and we decided, since we were on the big lake, we might as well take advantage of the lack of wind. So we paddled all night uh, in a full moon, which was really quite romantic, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> Anyway, in those days, uh, we only had ISO 64 films, so these <laughs> haven't come out so well. In fact, I was a couple of weeks ago, I was worried what I was going to do, but I found a place at, uh, at U of T to uh, scan in our old 35 millimeter slides. So that's what you're seeing here. And some of these are copies of George's 35 millimeter slides. So. Anyway, that's the uh, sunrise the next morning where we camped and slept for a little bit. Then we portaged across a peninsula to save a long paddle on this big lake. You can see we were carrying wood at that time. Still bugs. We saw a lot of wildlife, but not. Uh, we never saw any herds of caribou. I think the biggest group we saw was maybe eight or ten together. Here's one prancing by. And here's some cranes, and the, there's the one owl that we saw. Here, coming out of uh, Yathkid uh, in a long, rapid, uh, John and I nearly swamped our canoe pretty much filled with water. George, fortunately, had made these beautiful deckings which snapped onto the canoe around the sides, but uh, the one in his canoe was better than the one in our canoe. And <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we made it down that rapid eventually. So here is uh, what you can see on this uh, website at the University of Toronto. They left the river at September 1st after a lot of sleet and snow and went over a lot of portages here all measured out. Ferguson Lake and eventually down the Ferguson River over to Hudson Bay over there somewhere. He hired uh, some more Inuit guides at, uh, at this camp actually to get him through this, this region. So the campsites up there are just magnificent. You can see miles and miles in every direction. Choose just about anywhere to pitch your tent. We took several walks in the barrens. And I was also amazed at these uh, tiny plants. They're about maybe uh, five centimeters high, each of these plants. So you, if you're just walking on the barrens, you really don't notice them unless you stop and really take a closer look at the ground below you. 
I don't know what those are, but somebody here probably does. That evening, probably uh, on Ford Lake, another big lake, a beautiful, fine evening, gorgeous sunset. Uh, Then we came down to a 30-mile lake after Ford Lake. It's a long lake running east-west on the Kazan, from the west to the east, actually. And here we saw probably the biggest uh, Inuit uh, campsite. There's John sitting in one of the big uh, tent rings that were there. There were probably eight or ten tent rings, and we saw two open graves there with the remains of the skeletons still there. And here's one of the food caches with uh, Mike down inside. I was full of caribou bones at the bottom. But I think this was the most beautiful Inuksuk we saw. It was fabulous uh, construction. Well, this picture says it all. I was determined to catch a big fish on our last big lake, 30-mile lake. So I was fishing all day. And that's what I came up with. <laughs> that's what George came up with. And previously, I'd lost quite a few lures trying to land big trout into my canoe, but uh, I just was totally incompetent. And we'd broken our fishing rods by the end of the trip. They were now about a foot long. (laughs) Anyway, we managed. (laughs) By now, it was getting pretty cold. We were getting close to the middle of August. And... uh, the sky started to look cold in the evening, too, but still beautiful sunsets. And then we came to Kazan Falls, which is a beautiful thing with a gorge going down about, uh, I don't know, several hundred meters below it. This is a picture of the gorge. We decided not to run it just for safety, but to portage around it. But I'm sure you can canoe down there if you want to. And this is at the top of the falls, another group uh, photograph, a couple of group photographs. That's the falls themselves. And then the uh, long, fast run down to Baker Lake on the river. But we came across this beautiful uh, granite knoll off to the east in the beautiful uh, evening sunlight. So we stopped and took a hike over there. It was longer than we thought. But the view from the top was uh, totally amazing. And I think that's Baker Lake in the distance that you can see there. When we got to Baker Lake, we were windbound seriously for the first time. And actually had to stop pretty much at the mouth of the river. The next day we went on struggling all day and just made about eight miles. Uh, but we came across this uh, Inuit camp. So these people were out from Baker Lake for the weekend hunting in their motorboats, and they had their white tents set up. Uh, But they didn't really speak much English. Nevertheless, they were incredibly uh, hospitable to us and eventually invited us into their tent where they had this huge pot of caribou stew boiling away. So we had a big feast with them. Uh, It was fantastic. And this little guy uh, was really good at hunting ptarmigan out on the... uh, on the barrens with just winging rocks at them. Anyway, we woke up at 4.30 in the morning and those they'd all gone. <laughs> the wind was still howling. But we got up and uh, tried to paddle on a bit. In fact, at that point, George took off a, a direct route across a bay instead of following the bay. I was too petrified. I stayed in the bay. But eventually the wind beat George and he had to come back in. And there we are (laughs) at uh, lunch after that futile struggle. So by now we were quite cold. And uh, these are uh, John Blackborough's hands at that point. He was suffering fairly severely from exposure. Anyway, fortunately, later that afternoon, the wind actually died down a bit. And we made it uh, across from the South Shore to between these two islands that showed these islands on our map, so we paddled merrily across here, only to hit this sandbar, which is not shown on the map. So we had to make a portage of half a mile or so. <laughs> Quite annoying. But then the final run into uh, 
Baker Lake was fine. We had a tremendous uh, greeting party. These guys grabbed our packs and took us up and showed us where to camp. That's the Hudson Bay Post at that time in 1974. And I'll leave you with this final picture of Baker Lake at that time. There you can see an ocean-going ship. George persuaded the captain to take our canoes back to Montreal, and I think they eventually got back to Toronto about February. But we flew out to Churchill uh, the next day. Anyway, it was a tremendous trip, and I just want to thank George for organizing it and taking me along. Thank you, George. And thank, you, and thank you very much, John, for this wonderful uh, memory for, for some of us, too, who keep, whose memories isn't that good anymore. <laughs> <laughs>